Welcome to, the, to today's webinar, Responding to Student Demand with Agile Teaching and Learning Strategies. My name is Megan Raymond, and I lead programs and sponsorship here at WCET. If this is your first event with us, please get on our website and learn more about us. As we go through the webinar today, if you have any questions, please enter them into the Q&A and use the chat for discussion. We will ask that you move your question if it's in chat into the Q&A so we can keep track of those and make sure we don't lose your question. You should be able to access the slides and then this is being recorded and we'll share a link out next week. We'll also share any additional resources. If you'd like to participate in the Twitter discussion, the hashtag is WCET Webcast. This webinar is hosted in partnership with Cengage. Again, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, go ahead and enter them into the Q&A. We'll be monitoring those and get to those during the Q&A portion of the webinar. Today, we have a wonderful moderator to lead this discussion. Please welcome Natalie Skadra. She's the Executive Director of Learning and Accessibility with Cengage. Welcome, Natalie. Thanks, Megan. Hi, everybody. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're calling from or joining us from. Uh, thanks for joining us. My name, again, is Natalie Skadra, and I'm the Executive Director of Learning at Cengage. And uh, for those of you who might not be familiar with Cengage, uh, we provide um, higher education instructors and learners uh, and leaders the ability to um, thrive in their programs with course materials built around their needs, helping institutions across the country face challenges of affordability and digital transformation. We are the underwriter and primary partner for the research uh, that we're going to be talking about today, which is the Digital Learning Pulse Survey. Uh, this survey was launched in the spring of 2020, and the goal was um, of this longitudinal study was to understand the ongoing impact of the pandemic on higher education. And this April, Bayview Analytics and Cengage released the latest findings of the DLPS. The latest sample includes responses from over 2,000 students and 1,000 faculty and administrators. Today, I'm joined by two institutional leaders who will share how they're responding to student demand with Agile Teaching and Learning Strategies, as well as our research partner. So uh, let me briefly bio, uh, give a bio of our wonderful panelists. Uh, Dr. Jacinth Coltman is the Vice President of Academic Technology at Monroe College in New York City. She has served students for more than 25 years and is a dedicated and innovative educator with a passion for developing, designing, and implementing academic technology. She led the college's transition to the virtual classrooms at the onset of the pandemic and its continual efforts to identify and resolve technology gaps that challenge student success. Next, we have uh, Justin Daymeyer. He's the Executive Director of Education Technology at Ivy Tech Community College. Justin is, um, and so Ivy Tech, if you're not familiar, is Indiana's community college system. He is a former high school biology teacher and tech director, and is also an adjunct online instructor at Ivy Tech. And finally, I want to introduce Jeff Seaman. He's the director at uh, Bayview Analytics, and um, he conducts regional, uh, national, and international research projects, including the one that we're talking about. Um, he is involved in survey design, sampling methodology, data integrity, statistical analysis, and reporting. So welcome, um, everybody. So Jeff, I thought we'd start off with you um, by sharing a little bit of the history and the purpose of the research partnership with Cengage and um, our other partners that are involved. Uh, thank you. And as you mentioned, this started right at the beginning of the pandemic where um, Cengage reached out to Bayview Analytics with a question, which is how do we figure out what the impact is and how education is coping with this? It's interesting because it's uh, one, it's a very, interesting project, um, partly for two key reasons. One is this is our sixth time that we've done it. So we've been able to keep looking at the same type of audience over and over to see how they're changing, what they're coping with, what their issues are. And the other is we it's not just Bayview and Sandy, to many other organizations involved. And they've been, it's been really interesting because at the very beginning, everybody had the same questions. 
what's going on, how can we deal with our members, how can we help them? But on the other hand, we also didn't want to be doing something where we're at, at asking the same people over and over again from everybody what was going on. So we pooled our resources for one outreach um, and it's been quite informative. We'll get to the results in a bit, but each, so this is six times we've gone out to uh, representative national samples. So far we have a total across those six of over 8,000 faculty and administrative responses and 6,700 student responses. And it's one of the other really important parts of this is we can ask the exact same questions of students, faculty, and administrators to see how they're agreeing or disagreeing um, with some pleasing, surprising results that the level of agreement is quite high with some key differences. So it's been very useful to, to take a look at that. Great, thank you. And so can you share some of these um, interesting findings and, and some of the biggest findings of the most recent survey? And then also put them in context of um, any other research in online and, and hybrid or blended learning? Um, happy to. So um, Bayview Analytics has been looking at and measuring attitudes for online learning since 2003. Um, and early on, there was considerable skepticism about whether online was going to be any good or not. Um, that's, we've seen that slowly change over a period of time, but we've also seen some major changes happen at the beginning of the pandemic in everybody moving to emergency remote and pieces, and then ongoing since then, that have fundamentally changed the way that institutions offer their courses and fundamentally changed the attitudes and expectations on the part of faculty, admin, and more, most importantly, students. Um, the one of the pieces we wanted to understand first was, is this working for students? So we asked in multiple times everybody to grade um, on a just a ABC failing kind of grade how uh, to a number of questions. And the key one was how well are your courses for students meeting your educational needs, independent of anything else, whether delivery method or whatever else. How well do, do you, if you're grading your course today, what grade would you give it? And what we've seen is that one, um, students are generally quite pleased and that the level of their satisfaction continues to go up. Every time we go out and measure students, the number of students who are giving a grade of A that, uh, goes up. And the difference by what mode they're taking is not as striking as, as we had thought going in, that there is still, so um, our most recent data from spring, uh, this past spring, this right now is 68% um, of the students taking only in-person courses are giving a grade of an A. 62% of students taking only online courses are also giving an A grade for how well their courses are meeting their needs. Uh, we found this, um, this was different than we had expected. We expected a bigger difference between those who were taking online. But when we probed students, we found that many of them were surprised at how well the online courses met their needs um, because they had never had that experience before. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? Um, the other question that we want to understand, and this is one that's changed since the pandemic, is do you like these online courses and do you want to keep doing them? And this is one where we thought, okay, students, do you want to take online courses and who wants to take online courses going forward? Because we asked both of the questions about what you're doing today and what your desires for future education. And what we're seeing is a growing set of students saying they strongly agree or somewhat agree that they want the option to take fully online courses. And that that's different, somewhat different by what kind of courses they're currently taking. So if they're taking only in-person courses, um, it's still a majority who are saying they want that option. And clear, by the time you take, ask the students who are taking online courses, they definitely want to continue more than 78% at currently saying it. And so what we've seen the same pattern each time we've gone out for each cycle that there is a strong demand 
across all modes of instruction for future on for the option for future online courses that it's strongest among the online those who are taking online and that every time we go out that level of desire for that online courses goes up and so the question is are we going to see that the next time around because we have two more of these schedules one starting this next fall Okay, great. Yeah, it'll be curious to see the results from the fall survey. Certainly, are we going to continue to see this um, progression? Uh, and certainly understanding what's behind um, that, uh, that growth in uh, satisfaction. So Justin, I want to turn to you a little bit um, and ask you to share a little bit about the uh, community that Ivy Tech serves and also um, your role. Given your role in ed tech, um, what resonated with you with these spring results? Yeah, sure, I'd be happy to. So um, I think Natalie, as you said earlier, um, Ivy Tech is Indiana's community college. So we've got 19 full service campuses spread throughout the state of Indiana and numerous sites. So every member of the Indiana population is very, very close to one of our campuses and has ample opportunity to take advantage of um, the career paths that Ivy Tech offers. And our student population as a result of that is incredibly diverse, right? So we've got um, first generation students, we've got high school dual credit students, we have dual enrolled students. We have students who are trying to level up in their careers and we're having students who are choosing Ivy Tech as a route to transfer to another four-year institution. So I think we share that in common with a lot of community colleges. It's just a very broad scope for, uh, for us. So um, in my role in ed tech and supporting our faculty and students as they, as they tread through these different learning modalities, um, I really, it stands out to me that the students continue to have a strong demand for this type of flexibility with their educational choices. Right, I think they want flexibility in the career paths they have and the technical certificates that we offer um, and the other educational components we have, but they also want that flexibility of delivery to meet their meet the needs that they have uh, as individuals. So that continues to, to surprise me and see that, see that growth. Um, the other thing that kind of stood out to me in this data was that, um, was still that the in-person only students still saw the greatest gains in success, right? So I think that that speaks to a dynamic between what we know students want, right? And what perhaps some students may need. And so how do we as institutions thread that needle and give them that flexibility they need, but also support them through that journey um, and give them an opportunity to take advantage uh, of all of the things that an on-campus presence offers um, and then supplement that with, with these flexible modalities. Yeah, and I think there's a lot to unpack in, in what, uh, some of what you just said, especially around um, how do we meet the students where they are, where they say they are, right? I want more online, I'm finding greater satisfaction, but we also see success, greatest success in the on-ground in-person students. So um, just simply want to switch over to you for a second and have you share a little bit about um, the student populations that you serve at Monroe College, how similar or dissimilar might they be? Um, to where um, Justin is, and also what resonated with you given that student population. Absolutely. Uh, so I would agree with a lot of the things that Justin said, especially when you think about want versus need. So Monroe is in the middle of New York City. We're located, uh, we have a campus in the Bronx, we have another in New Rochelle, and then another on the island of St. Lucia in the Caribbean. So if you think about our New York City population, Commuter College on our Bronx campus, on our New Rochelle campus, we have all of the dorms. So we have international students from about 93 countries, um, about 50% of our population are African-American, another 35% Hispanic, and then, you know, the others. So we call it the melting pot. We are here to, just like Justin in the community college system, support those students who want to take that next step, all right? So whether it's a career, whether it's moving up in employment, et cetera, but we're here to provide for that need. So when it comes to the wants versus need, you know, I found that so glaring in the survey because if you think about what the pandemic did, we had to move quickly into an environment where a lot of people were just not comfortable, right? So for those of us who are in technology, who were already teaching online, who already had, you know, um, the bells and whistles in place, it was an easy switch. But for our students and for our faculty, 
that might not have been the case. So here you're talking about now a generation or a population that may not have had the necessary skills to make that move, but then they survived. And that to me was one of the most uh, dynamic things about this pandemic is the resilience of our students, the resilience of the faculty to know that they were pushed into this environment and yet they survived, they persevered. So, you know, when you think about the want versus the need, what we decided to do at Monroe was, as we are creating our schedules, if you think 2020 coming into fall 2021, we thought we will gently start moving them back on site, but the resistance came. We're not ready to come back on campus, you know? So we had to really think about those decisions as well. What is it that we want as a college versus what the students may want versus what they actually need. So we started um, with just gently placing particular classes on site. You know, our, our clinical classes had to be on site. So that population had to return, you know. Uh, so that's where really, <clears throat> excuse me, it came in with the want versus the need. A lot of our remedial courses we placed on site because we knew those students needed a little more handholding. They needed more help, right? So the survey to me was, it, it, there was nothing shocking in the survey because I saw it myself with our own population. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think that that's, um, it, it showed that not only did uh, students and faculty have to sort of be resilient and flexible and students are looking for flexibility. But at that time and, and still to today, I think we're seeing a need for a lot of flexibility um, and adaptability. And so Jeff, I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit to that. You know, we're talking about wants and needs, but what's driving some of the trends um, that we're seeing, both um, the success of the students that are in on ground, but also uh, the the growth of students who are feeling like online is successful, they're doing well, they're they're interested and optimistic about it. Um, I thought what uh, Justin was mentioning, you know, the word flexibility comes up over and over again. And it's interesting that it comes up from the students, but it also comes up from faculty and administrators. That this is that there's a there's a resi there's an understanding now that they didn't have before of what of the array of things that they can do. And part of this is uh, like the, um, talking about that change at the very beginning and everybody trying to cope with moving to someplace they had never been before and doing this. Um, uh, our first round of this survey found that 97% of the institutions were using faculty who had never taught online before having to teach online and that there was a level of fear or just concern or depending on how strongly you held it between the faculty and their ability to perform come fall. And institutions really responded to that. And by the time we got around to that first fall, faculty said they were ready to teach because all of them had said that they had had an opportunity to get professional development, that they had an opportunity to plan their courses, that they had an opportunity to understand what they need to do. And it wasn't like this, I have to make the changes in the middle of the term. And students had done that same transition. And what we've seen and asked of the students each time and asked of the faculty each time is what's working, what's not working. And among students, among faculty, among administrators, sort of this flexibility always comes through. The ability of that students want it, that faculty actually want it. Faculty want the flexibility to teach in different modes. Um, we're seeing that, and in some cases for faculty, it's something they've always done. But for many, it's brand new that they're understanding, and they're understanding the tools that they didn't have before. Um, there's a great, um, greater appreciation for digital materials than they didn't have before. They, there's a greater appreciation for the technology infrastructure institutions which many institutions ramped up to provide that level of support that wasn't there before. But overwhelmingly, it has been the flexibility. It's not been without some concerns. The biggest concern from the part of students is a sense of isolation. 
and the need to have better communications. And what we've heard from students um, is that they actually, the faculty to student communication, they think is very good in their online. They miss the student to student communication that they're used to in an in-person course. And that's the biggest negative we've heard from that audience. But even with that negative, you know, we're still seeing a huge proportion of the students want more online going forward. Yeah, yeah, that social presence is uh, an ongoing factor in uh, student success in online courses. Um, and so you said you were talking about flexibility, but also um, you said something that I thought was interesting, uh, Jeff, that appreciation of the digital materials. So just in how are you seeing, you know, what are you seeing students asking for or demanding? Are you seeing a shift in now that they have options um, and they're not forced to online? What are you seeing? And also, um, what do those tools look like? It's a really unique question uh, for us. Um, a year ago, we're now a full year into what we call our Ivy Plus program, which is fully inclusive uh, textbook materials. Uh, and that's been a real win for our students across the board. So our demand is somewhat forced on our students because it is a digital first model, right? So, but that eliminating that burden that they have to pay for their textbooks, it's just included in that bottom line cost for them. That has taken and relieved just so much stress for those students. And then our ability to leverage the digital platforms that we have, so our learning management system, um, partnerships like what we have with Cengage to be able to deliver that material prior to the start of class and in an easy way while still giving them that flexibility that some of some some of our students want in that they may still want a print option, right? So they've got all of those options, it's all included. So the demand is an interesting thing for us. I think prior to the pandemic and prior to the rollout of Ivy Plus, there was still an increased demand. We were finding that our curriculum committees and our faculty were adopting more digital first um, content, particularly in our online environment. And then, so they were well prepared to be able to take this leap, but the feedback from our students has been overwhelming. And I think that the data has supported that, that, that that's been a good decision as well. For some of our courses that are using Cengage and other titles, we found that that delivery early and getting them that access to those textbook materials, it's actually co correlated to an increase in student success. So that's been really, really powerful for us. So um, the demand is there. I see that, that the students have embraced that. Um, it does cause a bit of an equity issue right? I think it's easy to say, hey, we just should have this digital first model. We should make these materials available to our students. But like I said, we have a very diverse population, right? So we have students who may want to take advantage of these flexible op you know, options. They don't have the means to have those digital devices that, that the materials require, or they don't have the bandwidth in their area to be able to deal with that. So as a college, we're trying to find ways to support them so that they can take advantage of those options. And where they can't, try to help them identify those, those other modalities um, that, may be, that may be beneficial for them. I'll say the other thing that stands out to me, Jeff mentioned something about, you know, we keep using that word online, right? And I think it's a bit of a ubiquitous term, right? Because our students would tell you, um, you know, we've got a, a modality we call virtual instruction, which is which is synchronous, right? But it's at a distance via Zoom. A lot of colleges may call that online live. Right, but our students don't oftentimes make a distinction between what is a fully asynchronous online experience and what is a, a synchronous online experience. So I'll be I'll be curious to find out if there's any insights in the data that show um, a difference in those. But across the board, that that digital content has been very helpful for us, regardless of the modality that they've chosen. Yeah, that's interesting. I don't know, Jeff, if that if there's uh, we we have any insight into that in the in the data or not, or if that's something to look into that Justin raises around. Um, is it synchronous or asynchronous? We don't have a specific question about that in this survey. We have been tracking that in others, and we've been tracking that um, in the mining the text comments from the students and the faculty members. Um, there's, uh, I, I would just. Um, echo what Justin had said that we see students who don't who move seamlessly between those and we see students who have a strong preference for one or the other um, but it's still and I would also probably say or given everything else it's a moving target when we ask them this fall the answer is going to be different than what if we asked them this past spring Sure, yeah. Um, and I want to pick up on something that Justin was talking about, um, about equity and with digital and moving to more digital. 
Uh, and so just since I think you have uh, a reference to the sort of no child, no adult left behind, and um, and I'm wondering if there is a connection there to sort of equity and um, in terms of access. Absolutely a connection. Uh, that, <laughs> that phrase was coined from actually the 2001 No Child Left Behind Act. Um, and it was all about fairness, affordability, equity, you know. Uh, so when the pandemic came around, that's what hit us the hardest, right? Because our students were so used to having, um, to coming on campus to do everything, right? Our labs were well suited for everything. We had computers, thousands of computers on campus not in their homes. So now when we had to shut down the campuses, it became, well, how am I going to complete my assignments? How am I going to complete the semester? The pandemic hit in the middle of the semester, you know? So it almost became, how do I survive? It's not, it's no longer fear. It's no longer a fear playing field uh, because I paid my money. I'm in class. I want to learn. This is a scary environment for everyone, but how do I now survive? So equity became almost paramount. How do I put the tools into the hands of the students so that they can survive? And that became our first you know, um, line of defense. That's what we had to tackle. It wasn't about the technology because we already had that, right? We already had the technology in place. We knew we could support the students online because we were already teaching online courses. Moving to a virtual environment took a couple of training sessions from the faculty, but they knew how to now compete. But how about the students who did not have the laptops or the desktops or the internet access in order to be able to successfully complete the classes. So that's where we, um, you know, we actually moved first. We had to put the device in the hands of the students. So the same way New York City public schools started giving out the laptops and tablets to their students, we followed suit. So for all of our students who did not have laptops, we put a laptop in their hand. That was First, you had to be able to give them some means in order to complete their education. Then it became internet access. Fine, I have a laptop, but how do I connect? I don't have internet at home. Thank goodness for a lot of our, you know, if you think about in New York City, it's Con Ed, you know, or uh, Optimum or the various uh, partners um, that were willing to now give these students the ability to log in for free. All right, call us up, we will show you, we will give you the internet access because once again, it became a, we're all in this together. It was no longer big I and little you, it's how can we all survive? We're all in this together, it's new for us. And even with Cengage, opening up their platform to everyone to say, hey, if you had a textbook or if you needed now access to this, you can no longer go to the library, the platform is open, log in, the textbooks are free. We've never seen that before. You know, so affordability and access, that's where I said no child or adult because I took it from the children, right? We were so geared around the children not being left behind, but we have so many adults who fell into the same vein that we weren't thinking about. Yeah. Not just the students. Yeah, for faculty sure. also, <laughs> right? So you had faculty and staff that were now supporting these students that also needed that access as well. So we had to think about it in totality, not just student, faculty. What can we do to support our faculty? What can we do to support them in supporting the students? So training, now became nonstop. I, you know, it literally felt like it was 24-7 uh, because if you weren't supporting the students, you were supporting the faculty as well. Yeah, it's a great point about supporting the faculty um, and, and the usage of that. I think also a lot of the, the kids that went through No Child Left Behind are adults now and they're in schools now. So it brings us uh, to where we are. Um, Jeff, 
we've been talking a little bit about students, but Jacinth talked about faculty. And so um, it's a good sort of segue into asking a little bit more about faculty and, um, and what we learned from um, the results of this most recent survey and their use of digital course materials. Yeah, we've seen, um, well, we've been tracking faculty attitudes for over a decade. So this is, we were seeing this continuous trend of faculty who were becoming um, a larger proportion of them positive about online, but still a small minority of all faculty. Um, a larger proportion of faculty becoming positive or using um, digital materials, but also still a smaller proportion of them. And we, we're seeing some big differences in those attitudes by discipline. Uh, for example, after the digital materials pieces, science and math really like the digital far more than uh, literature, for example. Very big differences in terms of what the level of support was for those. Um, and then what we saw is a major step function when all of these faculty members now got exposed to stuff that they'd never seen before and, and had to move. And so we've asked a couple of things. One was, do you like, are you using digital materials? Do you like them? How, how well are they working for you? And do you expect to do more of it going forward? Are you more optimistic about digital materials now? Are you more optimistic about online now than you were before? And what we saw is one, as mentioned, like a big increase when we, right after the pandemic, and by the first, after they had about a full term of teaching with preparation, then they were much more positive, positive about digital materials, much more positive about online, much more positive about use of technology and technology facilitated education than they were pre previously. And then every term that we've seen, the level of that goes up. The proportion using digital materials, the proportion were positive about digital materials and the proportion said they want to use more digital materials in the future goes up every term among faculty members. It also goes up among the administrators saying that's how they're trying to plan their programs. Um, and we see, you know, what's partly driving it is student attitudes are going more and more positive. One of the interesting pieces we saw is that prior to the pandemic, the biggest reason that faculty gave for not using digital materials was they thought their students didn't like it. The students wanted print, we're not, I'm not going to use it. And now what they're seeing and hearing is many faculty are getting the, the feedback from students that they prefer the digital materials. Not every, not all students, not across the board, but that changed dramatically that we're not seeing that in faculty members in their reasoning anymore. There, there are still, there's still concerns. I don't have the exact material I need in digital that I have in print and it's not the same or some, but the overall pattern is showing them a huge growth in the acceptance of the digital materials and it's going across all of the disciplines. So we still have big dif differences in disciplines, but they're all moving in the same direction. Yeah, I think that that, that access to also, uh, the access to the, the materials, right? Like print versus digital. Justin, you mentioned that a little bit uh, earlier. And, um, and I'm wondering if you can kind of speak to what what are, are you hearing students say um, at Ivy, what their modality preference is, what, how are they using the digital materials and tools, how are faculty, is there an alignment there, um, especially given that sort of, um, the, that students want to be more flexible and then, uh, but their success is still on ground. So I think we're still back at this need, want thing and success. Yeah. Yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right. I think prior to the pandemic, a lot of our focus is how do we close that gap that you might see between traditional face-to-face -face courses and our online programs, right? That was, you know, that's entirely why we stood up a centralized, you know, online academic unit to be able to address those concerns and really make some gains in that area. And I think throughout the pandemic, that focus isn't lost, but I think that we realize that the old comparisons that we're making might be different, right? And then the things that students need to be successful in those areas uh, may not be what they were before. They've survived, I mean, to just this point, they have survived that pandemic and that changes the game for us entirely. 
Um, so students, you know, what drives our look at the modalities is still what students want. They're going to register for the courses that they, they feel best meets their needs. We're not going to have as much say so in that as we think we can. We can attempt to limit and kind of shape those options that are available, I think, with an eye towards intentionally scheduling when our synchronous courses are taking place, um, both individually at the campuses and across the system, right? So if we have students taking advantage of these flexible options, we really have to work hard to make sure that they can they can also exercise that synchronicity where, where it makes sense and, and do all of that work. Um, but with that success still being higher on ground, I think we're starting to change our approach with how we look at the analytics and look at the data around that and say, so all things being equal, right? And so we're actually looking at, at starting some more data science approach to how we analyze those learning modalities and really understand how students are performing and try to keep as many things equal as we can, right? So course, instructor, and really look at those, those differences because just the blanket comparison between you know, traditional and face-to-face -face may or may not give us all the information we need to tailor our programming the way it needs to, to really support that, to really support student success. Because we've closed a lot of that gap in a lot of our areas in our online courses, but then they've had this explosion of the, of the synchronous online courses. And that's a, different, that's a different modality and a different experience altogether. And what we found is that in some cases, not all, but in some, the success there isn't as good as we would like it. So now we've got to focus some atten attention and intentionality with our faculty on how to prepare for that, how to how to make their students be successful and find that online community, right? So whether it's asynchronous or synchronous, if they are not physically with us on our campus, how do we still engage them and make them feel a part of that class and connected to their instructor and their fellow students? I, I think that's really the challenge uh, that we have in helping those students transition to uh, all of these flexible modalities and, and how to how to thrive in that environment. Yeah, I'm wondering if you can share a little bit of uh, maybe for the people who have joined us some sort of ideas or tips and tricks that you have seen that's really successful or that's proven to be successful in terms of the use of digital and um, and the tools that are available. Yeah, so I think one of the one of the biggest things that we did um, is to offer our kind of version of a high flex model we call learn anywhere. Um, and that's a, a really interesting opportunity for our students. They have the choice from one class session to the next as to whether or not they want to attend on campus face to face, or if they want to attend remotely via Zoom. The option to be asynchronous in that is not there. So I don't know that it's a truly a high flex, but we did that and what we, we invested a lot of time and effort and energy to build out the technology in the classrooms to be able to support that delivery but also to, to support all of the other delivery methods that we have, right? So, you know, we've got interactive smart boards, we have cameras, we have all of those tools to make that, you know, synchronous experience at a distance as close to the virtual or the, the in-person um, format that we can, right? So that students can connect, the instructors can instruct um, seamlessly just like they would and not have to worry. It's still a challenge, don't get me wrong right, to, for faculty to have to make that adjustment to say, I've got a certain number of students who are remote and a cert certain number of students who are on ground with me, but we've invested heavily to try to support them in that and make that experience as cohesive um, as we possibly can so that no matter what's happening in that classroom, that everybody has an equal, ex an equal opportunity and a similar experience. So that's, that's the technological investment that we've made and then our training to be able to support faculty and students in that um, follow suit. All right, so. Um, providing students with a sense of community, um, giving them the access to the technology that's going to help support that, yep. um, and and with faculty. So, just since I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about what um, you all have done at Monroe to that's been effective to um, sort of support students regardless of modality. Sure. So, similar to what Justin is doing at Ivy Tech, we have done the same. So, we have. Now, if you think about all of the different types of modalities, right? So we have classes that are running in three week models, five weeks, seven and a half weeks, 15 weeks. You have a hybrid models, you have virtual classes, you have fully online courses. So um, it's almost a mixed model anymore. Uh, for years, we have had online on ground. Pandemic now, brought us, you know, what some of us consider virtual, meaning it is a synchronous class. However, your instructor is right there at the same time 
um, that you would be having your classes on ground, they'll be joining you virtually. We also have what we call the hybrid model, similar to Justin's, what he calls the high flex, where you may have a group of students who are on campus because they not only choose to be on campus, but they know whatever that class is, they need more support. So they have chosen to be on ground where the support is readily available to them. And then you also have their counterparts who's in the same class, but are joining us through, we are a Blackboard campus. So we use Blackboard Collaborate for all of our courses. So you have them joining in both models. And yes, the technology is necessary. The training is paramount, not just for students, but once again, I can't forget my faculty because they have to be able to teach in both modalities, right? Teaching alone in collaborate in a virtual environment when you're used to an audience right in front of you, that was difficult enough. But now knowing that you have students at home, some on the train, some at work, some in your classroom, because you really don't know where they are, right? When you're in a virtual environment, you have no idea where your students are. And that's another thing that we saw. And Jeff, I would love to know if the students would be honest enough to tell us where are they actually taking their classes, right? Where are you when you are in my class? Because I guarantee you with some of my students, I know they are not at home sitting very attentive in front of a computer. That's not happening. But we still have to be able to support them. We still have to be able to teach. We still have to be able to maneuver all of that. And that takes training. So we truly believe in training, ongoing professional development training, not just for students, but for the faculty and staff as well. We developed what I call the A-team. It's my academic technology team during the pandemic. We always had an academic technology department, but my team now became a virtual team because now we're everywhere, we're, you know, we're working from wherever we are. So instead of the faculty coming to us, we developed an ongoing 9 a.m. in the morning, 6 p.m. at night, where anyone can just drop in for help. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We didn't wanna support the students. They had a separate portal. Guess what? They came to our portal. <laughs> You know, even though we had a separate one for the students, they knew, hey, if the teachers can get their answers right away, go into this portal, let me drop in and see if they will answer my questions as well. So the A-team became just, uh, you know, we're here to support all. Monday through Friday, you know, we're there. And that has helped. That has helped tremendously because not only are we doing training and ongoing training in technology, it's also in best practices. How do I solve this? This is happening in my class right now. My connection is bad. What can I do? It, it, it's anything. I can't access my textbook. I tried to go to Cengage. It's not working. And may I put a plug in for the Cengage support staff? They have been absolutely phenomenal through all of this. I cannot say enough about the support that we have received from our, you know, our own team here on the East Coast. But just to know that at the beginning of the semester, they held ongoing workshops for the students, office hours, for the students to just pop in and tell us, how do I use such and such? How do I access my ebook? How do I you know, gain access to this, this exam? It's not showing up for me. I should be seeing these questions, it's not there. And then the same for the faculty. Every new platform that we've added, Cengage has been there to now also help with some of the training. So if we adopted a book that's now a WebAssign or a CNAL or using MindTap, guess what? We have a team from Cengage that's also willing to train our faculty and then what do the faculty do? It becomes a train to trainer model. So after a couple of semesters, we see that no, they 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 don't need you anymore to hold their hands. They're okay, you know. That department is now strong enough in using all of these platforms where they are willing to help others. I would never have thought that 10 years ago when I was doing my, you know, the research for my dissertation, it was all about motivating faculty in technology integration. I didn't see this happening. <laughs> I didn't realize that, you know, this day would come, but now it is so rewarding to see 
that faculty who were scared, who were apprehensive about using technology. And I give a big shout out to my math professors. <laughs> they wanted nothing to do with using anything about technology. But now they're the first ones to raise their hands and say, I'll teach that class. Is it virtual? Is it online? I'll take a shot at it. Because they've learned that technology is nothing to be scared of. It's there to support if you have the proper training, if you have you know, the proper resources. And that's what we're all about. We want to give you the resources in order for you to succeed. Yeah, um, I think that that's, so I think if we look at the collection of, of experiences that um, Justin and Jacinthe, you have, have um, overseen at your institutions, uh, I'm hearing a lot about training and development, technology, support, whether it's in-house or through your partners, um, having access and that equity, um, and also just, again, those partnerships. So leveraging all of those, making sure that you're sort of thinking about all of these aspects for both the faculty, the institution, and the learner. And I think one thing that I want to turn everyone's attention to and make aware is student mental health and mental health. We know that mental health um, issues have definitely um, taken more forefront and uh, in recent years. Um, and so uh, I just wanna point out that Jeff, in February, you and your daughter published an article in ACCT's Trustees Quarterly Magazine that focused on student mental health. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about um, mental health and the findings related to barriers to learning. Uh, happy to. This, um, the article came out of the research from the digital Pulse Learning Survey, um, and we were asking, the first was that we asked students, faculty, and administrators, what was the biggest barrier for student success? Um, and all three groups said stress among students was number one. Um, it's, you know, there have been many times we've done surveys where students have a concern or admin has a concern and faculty have a concern and the concerns don't match. Um, this is not the case. The top three priorities were identical for all groups um, and that it was a clear number one, that the, the really big issue was stress. We know, um, and what we then when we probe from students, what's causing the stress? What is it that's, um, it's not new. Um, going to school, going when, especially when you're trying in a, many community college situations where you're trying to juggle family and work as well is stressful and that's not changed. Um, what has changed is the level. It's much more stressful now. Um, not just our studies, but a number of the other studies looking at that have been tracking mental health are showing that the, the scores on the stress scale are now higher than they've ever recorded for students in, in colleges. Um, and so we're trying to understand from students um, what's driving that. And part of it is the uncertainty. A whole bunch of the things that we're seeing coming from students have nothing to do with what's happening on campus or in their remote courses. It's happening, it's what's happening to them in the world around them. It's living through a pandemic. It's trying to make sure that they're, they still maintain their job if they have one. It's dealing with their family. It's dealing with their family who may, ha may have COVID. It's just, um, all of those things are in there. Um, but then we also ask a series of other questions like what do your, do you use resources at your campus and do you use um, and are they good for you? Are you meeting meeting your needs? And, that, um, and we, we have a couple of things on and the, what this article was particularly pointing out was the pattern that we heard overwhelmingly in students was the sense of isolation. Um, that the need for, I mean, I just heard both uh, talk about student communications, uh, community of students, community of, in, of instructors and, and part, and that's what, what students are reacting to, that there's a real, um, we heard, where I'm now, I love so much the flexibility of moving online. What I miss is I don't have a study buddy. Who I used to always, you know, we would meet before class and talk about how hard the assignment was or not. 
and that's not that's missing. And in particular, um, they were students were pretty positive about how well technology was facilitating their communication with their faculty members. They were not very happy about technology facilitating their communication with fellow students. That sense of community that they were looking for. In fact, um, both students and faculty give extremely high marks to one-on-one -on -one video replacing in-office visits that they both groups thought that was a much more effective use and much more productive way of them going forward. But the students then saying, you know, I come in, I log in, I see this, I see a couple little posted stamp faces of other people while I'm on my course, and then I go away and they don't have a sense of community. And they're looking for that. So I would tell you that as an, um, institutions and support people, the number one thing to think about is, you know, we've gone a great deal of teaching the faculty how to use this technology. We've done a great deal of teaching the students how to get access to the information and the content. We've not made a lot of progress in getting the students to be interacting with each other in this new environment. Yeah, that sounds like an action item for all of us then is to look for ways to design that into not only the technology, but also design it. I know as an instructional designer and in learning design, we look for ways to design that into uh, the learning content. So, um, well, thank you, Justin, Jacinth, and Jeff. I want to turn, we do have a question, um, and I want to make sure that those who have questions have an opportunity to ask them as we kind of get to the top of the hour. Um, so, uh, we do have a question. What institutional structures and cultures did you make sure were in places to enable faculty to spend time learning? And I think this is really important, and making mistakes around online teaching. Um, Justin or Justin, do you want to take that? Yeah, I can. I can start, Jacinth, unless you unless you want to. Up to you. You can go ahead. All right. Um, so I'll start with um, kind of taking the training baton and running with that. Um, in order to teach online for us, like many other institutions, we have a required training course that our online instructors have to go through where we really talk about those exact things. You know, how do you build community in your online course? What are the minimum requirements that we as an institution have for you if you're teaching an online course? And we've actually taken a cue from that and expanded that to other learning modalities. We've developed a course to give that same level of attention and support to our faculty um, in all of the other modalities that we offer. We, we call that our modalities for success training that we're launching this fall. And it's really, it's a pedagogical approach, right? What are those best practices that are gonna serve you well in those modalities? So all of the time and attention we're spending on our online courses, we're now turning our attention and giving our faculty that same type of training and support to be able to deal with um, those modalities as well. So you think of the instructional practice that you have in a face-to-face -face classroom, well, how do I do that if I'm in a hybrid course or if I'm in what we call our Learn Anywhere or I'm teaching virtually via Zoom? right? You can do all of the same things. You just have to execute it differently. So we try to talk to our faculty about how to be able to do that and then give them some, you know, impactful practices that they can take to their, take to their courses and implement right away. Okay. Just piggybacking on what Justin um, just said, one of the things that we also, we started this, you know, a number of years prior <clears throat> to the pandemic, in moving over to Blackboard as our LMS, what we also did was we created sandboxes for all of our instructors. So yep. every faculty member had a space where they could go in and just play. So all of the errors, the mistakes, the, you know, you're not gonna break anything. This is not your live class. So any new technology that they wanted to learn, that's where it was housed. Uh, so they had the ability to then practice even before flipping over to their live classes. Anything new that they wanted to do, they could practice in that sandbox. And as I mentioned, we do professional development uh, workshops every semester, multiple times throughout the semester. So they have that ongoing. The recordings are there, the ability to go back and relearn, you know, that's there as well. And they just build on that as we go through. I call um, some of the sessions for repeat offenders because we do repeat a lot 
lot of the, you know, the processes over and over again. We might have uh, faculty members who join us. You know, we do have a lot of adjunct faculty as well. We have a lot of practitioners who are not so much educators. So we also have those types of, of training and sessions. So we make it comfortable for the faculty to want to learn new things. We make it so that they understand that, you know, it's okay. We understand that this might not be your um, main body of knowledge, but we're willing to help you build upon that knowledge. Yeah, that's terrific. Um, yeah, so I think there's the, the culture of training, but then also the tools to say, look, here's your place to go and play and break things and feel okay about it and ask questions. So um, that's terrific. Uh, so I don't see any other questions. And so I'd like to end as we're kind of approaching uh, the last few minutes with a question for, for any of you, for each of you. Uh, and that is, what are you looking forward to this fall? Jacinth, do you wanna go first? I'll go sort of alphabetically. What am I looking forward to? Yeah, for this fall. Uh, <laughs> well, um, I would say with the students returning to campus, but they started doing that already. But what I'm seeing is, I guess, more students returning to campus and wanting to be on campus. Because as we saw throughout today's session, we have so many uh, of our students who still want to stay, they want to remain in that virtual or hybrid environment. Uh, our online platform has, as you know, the modality has picked up so tremendously throughout this whole process. But just to know that we are here, we're here to support you, that piece I do miss. I do miss students walking into my office and, you know, chatting. I miss not having to worry about face mask and, and you know, COVID and, and worrying about COVID and different variants. So yeah, I'm looking forward to the day when I can just be comfortable, <laughs> you know. Uh, I think that's what I'm looking forward to the most. Okay, Jeff, what are you looking forward to this fall? Um, this is, you know, as the data guy, I'm always looking for more interesting things to to, to understand about what's going on here. Uh, and my the questions we have going forward, a lot of them came up during this, this session, which is looking at how are things being different? And, and I'm always wanna take the student view first because that's the ultimate audience here. Um, between synchronous, asynchronous, the, the sort of the student choice model, I can pick whatever I want. Well, does that lead to more confusion or more sense of empowerment or maybe both? Um, does that lead to a better sense of success on, on the part of students? Um, and we really don't know. I mean, we're going into new territory. Um, every term we go out, there's less change than there was for the previous one, but there is still continuing change. And so we want to, it's pretty clear that the new normal won't be like the old normal, but we don't yet know what the new normal is going to be. And that's what I want to keep looking at and seeing as we begin to move in that direction. Great. We'll look forward to what that data reveals. Justin, what are you looking forward to? I'm, I'm somewhere in the middle. Uh, of both Jacinth and Jeff, I I am looking forward to visiting our campuses more. Right as as things have returned to normal from from kind of the I mean we are all still very cautious, but still we're all we're all getting back to, to being in person a little bit. And as much as I love virtual and online and the flexibility that that offers, there's sometimes no substitute for a little bit of time in person with our students and with our faculty. So I think visiting our campuses, getting to see some of our faculty face-to-face, -face, I've never had an opportunity to meet face-to-face. -face. Still some members of, of even my team that I've only met once face-to-face -face since I came on board into this position because of the pandemic and feeding off of that energy a little bit and feeding off of the energy of having buildings that have more students in them, right? As they're, as they're taking their, their first steps. And then like Jeff, I'm very, very interested to see what our students continue to choose, what our faculty choose, how are, how are they successful in those modalities and how that informs our decisions at the college as to what we should be offering to better serve our students. So I'm all over the place. I'm, I'm excited that, the, that we're wrapping up our summer term. I think we'll all get a little bit of a break and time to rest and recharge and then plan our, 
um, execute on our professional development that we want to offer. And, and getting to interact with all of that is always exciting. Um, and then like some others, I'm ready for fall. Fall is one of my favorite seasons. So cooler temperatures and, and the season change is always something fun to look forward to. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, for joining us today. Megan? Great. Thank you so much. I just really want to say thank you to the audience. Thank you, Justin, Jeff, Justin, and Natalie. You're our only non-J name, I noticed. <laughs> so thank you, everybody. This was a great conversation, and we'll follow up with additional information. I just want to quickly acknowledge our sponsors and our WCET supporting members that help underwrite our events and programs here at WCET. So thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful afternoon and best wishes this fall. Take care.